My guest today sets himself a humble challenge at the beginning of his book to bridge the disciplines of theology and history. The purpose of his work is to take the foreignness of history to another level by getting us to look and listen to voices who we would normally ignore or not seek out. The book is Remembering Lived Lives, a historiography from the underside of modernity out with Cascade Books. The author, our guest today, let's make him welcome, is Michael Jimenez. Michael did his PhD at Fuller Theological Seminary and is an instructor in both history and theology in Southern California. You can also get his book, Karl Barth and the Study of the Religious Enlightenment. That's out also. Please welcome Michael to Love, Rinse, Repeat. Well, Michael, welcome to Love, Rinse, Repeat. Thanks for having me. <laughs> That's really good to have you here. So we're talking about your book, uh, Remembering Lived Lives, a historiography from the underside of modernity out with Cascade Books. Uh, so I guess just like a broad question before we even start, like, you know, what got you to the point of writing history or, or exploring the both, both theology and, and history and these disciplines and, you know, where, where, where did that start? Was that something you were always kind of interested in uh, growing up? Uh, or was it something you kind of started to stumble upon as this is actually important to think about how we do history? Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, that's a great question. I think um, I generally was in um, the situation, um, perhaps other um, college students find, where they're trying to figure out exactly what they want to major in. Um, especially someone who just loves the humanities kind of across the board. So I was in that kind of uh, place where I'm like, well, I kind of want to study philosophy, but also want to study theology. And, but the historical angle always um, interests me. So I think that's what led me to study history. But I knew I wanted to study history that has something to do with like intellectual thought particularly when it, with regards to religion um, and then specifically uh, Christian history. But it's, um, I think part of the whole, um, the goal of the book is just how for myself that expanded into like a more global take and outside of particular, the particularism of uh, a particularity of, of um, just doing Christianity, but just trying to explore the links that you know one could find um, via history. So yeah, I, I think a lot of it was my my original like hesitation and like picking a major. And then once I put I uh, pitched my tent in history, I wasn't like I was just abandoning um, theology or religion or philosophy. Um, but um, I was able to explore it, but like with this like. And, and my, um, my uh, doctoral mentor is pretty good at this, trying like, to force me to stay in history. <laughs> you're not writing a philosophy paper, you're writing a theology paper. It's history, history, history. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. So the book opens with, with this. Remembering Lived Lives was written with the intention to bridge the gap between the historical and theological disciplines, which, you know, seems like a, a very... Uh, a, lovely but an audacious way to start a book uh to bridge bridge such a gap uh talk to us i guess what what then to kind of we've got into a bit of how you got interested in history and that came from also there was always this interest in philosophy and theology but i guess when did you come to see that oh there is this gap like there is a, a way that these two disciplines should be talking to each other more and and i guess why does that gap need to be overcome Mm, okay well yeah that's a really good question um so um i think the gap just kind of manifests itself while it was um studying theology in particular and every now and then the prof would uh tend to maybe tell a little anecdote or story out of history and that always like grabbed my attention more i think not that i wasn't enjoying like you know studying uh a particular like subject like Christology or eschatology, but like when they're able to like pull in um, a sample from history, um, you know, that got my antennas up and I was like, wow, you know, why can't we contextualize all these ideas um, to some extent? Cause I, I realized a lot of the, when I would press uh, people on this issue, it was like, well, hey, 
I'm not a historian, and then vice versa. I was in history class, and it was a religious subject. I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. And I would say like, hey, you know, tell me more about this. And they would immediately go, whoa, 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 no, I'm, I'm not, a, not a historian here. I'm, I'm a, I mean, or I'm not a, a theologian here. I'm a historian or I'm not a philosopher. And um, I'm wondering why the certain hesitation to do that. Because I know they obviously did enough of the homework to like add some of these points, but, um, and they, but they would just put this, these walls. I know part of it is like, um, especially with historians, it's kind of academic humility of like, hey, <laughs> this is what I concentrated on. This is what I know this is my comfort zone. And I'm just going to be a, I will speak freely about things here and not like branch out. Um, I think part of the reason why I kind of branched out was teaching all these um, general ed world history classes where you're kind of forced to like, whether you like it or not, you better branch out. And so like you're, you know, not completely making things up and um, doing that, you know, part of the curriculum is dealing with thought. And so I'm wondering, okay, as a good historian and a good history teacher, you're supposed to be doing this to some level. So um, I think I always got frustrated that, you know, there wasn't enough gauge engagement with this um, in my own background when I was studying. Cause I, I saw glimpses of it, but it wasn't like, it was like almost purposely of like putting themselves in their little like bubbles. Um, and I think as like, um, I, I ventured out and then realizing um, that there's these voices that are out there <laughs> that I never was exposed to because of maybe this uh, sense of like, I'm only going to talk about my comfort zone. Um, I mean, that, that kind of pushed me to kind of say like, hey, um, I mean, the world's always been this, this mixture. Um, it's not just something now, even though, you know, there's a lot of attention to be more global and realize um, post-World War II, we got this you know, this world that's a lot tinier, a lot closer, and peoples are moving across the world. So there's this tension to this, but I mean, it's always been there. <laughs> that's, I think that's part of the historical project, it's always been there. But why, why have we not paid attention to those voices that have always been there? Um, and so, it, you know, it's kind of a message like, okay, obviously pay attention to it now because more and more of these voices that, you know, some would say are outside of the Eurocentric you know, um, place are, are, are writing good books, always written good books, but like the immediate is like, obviously now that's happening. But I think as a historian, we'll say like, yeah, that's, that's been going on for centuries. You know, why, why haven't we done this? Why did it take now to do this? I mean, there's reasons why, but I think to that opening statement, that's, that's kind of where I was, I was trying to drive at is, is like, you know, now's the time to, begin to be more interdisciplinary um, so we can um, present a more clear and, and honest picture as much as possible. Yeah, I think that's that's helpful too, to, to see that you know, there is this gain to be made by, um, by bridging these disciplines, you know, by seeing how, you know, the, the where doctrine or where theological thought emerges from, what are the contests and conflicts and stories that are behind it and informing it. And, and similarly, you know, when you're looking at history, what are people's genuinely held beliefs and how do they, uh, how does that shape how people engage in history? So there's definitely like, it's from the book, you know, great benefits to both disciplines to, mm -hmm. to talking across uh, to each other. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> mm. uh, so you write, um, the, speaking of both disciplines, you write kind of that the best aspects of both disciplines uh, are when they do not forget to remember the past. Um, which made me think of there's the toward the end of when Harry met Sally, there's the scene when um, Aud Lang Sang sign is playing, and Harry talks about, you know, my whole life I don't know what this song means. Should old acquaintance be forgot? Does that mean we should forget old acquaintances, or does that mean that if we happen to forget them, we should remember them, which is not possible because we already forgot? So, so what does it mean then to, to not forget to remember the past? Uh, and what kind of posture does that that encourage one to take? Yeah, um, that's, a, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, because that is, I think that's <laughs> fundamentally when I open up a history course, it's always, um, 
<laughs> I try to do, I try to become a cheerleader and say like, okay, I know most of you don't want to be here. <laughs> it's a large, you know, group. Um, and I try to gauge them. Um, you try to be as transparent as possible. Ask like, okay, why, what do you have against history? Um, why is it normally, um, you know, people say like, well, I don't know why we have to study this stuff. Like what is, what's the importance for me today knowing what happened in the past? I mean, it's not usually framed that way. It's usually framed like, oh, history is so boring. It sucks. Like, why am I have to be here? Um, so I think that's a really important question because um, the sense of like um, relevancy is always, it's, I mean, at least since my, in my lifetime, it seems to be attached there. And, you know, I, I, it's not just me, but even students make the joke that when they learn history in high school here in the U.S., it's usually by like the gym teacher or the football coach. And so it's like, here, read this book. And then here's this exam. You just cover all these dates and names and stuff like that. So there's no, um, and that's where I think the narrative approach is important for me. There's no connection with the people on the pages. And so I think part of um, the role of the historian is of this narrator. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm a firm believer in like <laughs> enjoying a good story, like a good movie, like how Harry met Sally or something, right? There's something that years later, we're still like, hey, this is a fun movie. Let's go, let's go watch it. Why? Well, the story's good. The characters are good. So I think, I think just on the first level, there's like an aesthetic quality of, of good um, stories out of history that um, I think people, if they knew they were there, they would actually enjoy them or, you know, and then maybe the way that we tell those stories, um, students appreciate and they wouldn't have this, this kind of cavalier, like, ugh, who needs this stuff? You know, just sign me up for business school. Um, so I can like, you know, <laughs> make money pay off these student loans. Right. Um, so, and I think there's, um, so that's, that's the first part. I mean, that's just like the basic, um, you know, why, you know, have people teach history. I think on the second one is, um, I think as we are looking backward at historical event like um, 1945 and the fall of basically Europe after World War II, we're in this age where um, we realize um, there's the colonial question, the imperial question of the last couple of centuries and how that's kind of placed us in this world and it goes back to those oftentimes voices that were ignored. I, I, I wouldn't say they were like, you know, it's not, they weren't voiceless, those voices were there. I think history actually shows us, hey, there, there is all these voices out there talking about this stuff. We just haven't been reading them or, you know, and I think history can like get us to the point where we can return and, you know, actually address some of these voices from the past that um, can key in on what's going on um, in the present day and towards the future. Um, and so I think that's, that's an important aspect that I, I really try to like hone in on is, um, is, you know, looking at the past, both the good and the bad and seeing how it's, how, in fact, a lot of the, uh, the, the things that they were mixed up in are things that we're now handed off into our own laps and trying to deal with and um we're gonna do the same thing we're gonna be handed off to the next generation as well you know as, as i'm now i'm you know getting past 40 and have kids like now i'm thinking okay what the heck are we hanging them mm -hmm. i in the theological tradition i think obviously um that's one part of it but i just think culturally politically socially all sort of things like history has so much from those sectors that can um provide the information on you know how to address things um in the present day uh, moving towards the future but I, th I think you know for me personally the uh the just huge shift that happened after world war ii i think we're still we're still feeling that today <laughs> and um you know it, it's it's that long arm that long um view of history that we're, we're kind of caught up in it. And when you're in it, it's, it's hard to see where it's going, you know, what our place is in a lot of ways about it. We're trying to figure our way out, but 
you know, we have the vantage point to look back hundred years, thousand years to see like what people did with, with similar, um, um, issues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. So we, we kind of first connected about this book or about the idea of talking about your book. Cause I, I tweeted out one time, some of Carl Bart's advice for history students <laughs> and, um, before we kind of, the book engages Bart's work specifically, but before we kind of talk about that, you write in the preface uh, that in some ways this book narrates your journey from a sole concentration on the theology of Karl Barth to an overall inclusive project of thinkers around the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you wrote a recent article, which will be in the show notes, and we'll talk about it again in a little bit, um, that how, you know, you became more interested in histories than history, uh, more interested in global perspectives than European perspectives. I was thinking about how this personal journey mirrors uh, the way you note in the introduction to the book about the danger of a single story. Um, mm. And you, you, you cite the work of the Nigerian author, uh, Chimanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, how did this journey begin for you, this, this, this kind of stepping beyond the kind of single primary voice uh, of Bart or the, the single you know, narrative of history? Uh, and yeah, how did that start to begin for you? And, and how do you advise people to navigate that own journey? <laughs> yeah. Well, part of it might just be fatigue of <laughs> studying Bart for so many years. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I think, you know, some of it has to do with that when um, being in a doctoral program and I, I engaged Bart late in my undergrad years and then through, um, grad school and then my doctoral program I always wanted to do I mean again I, I want to do something with history because I thought he had like I still think he has these gems about thinking about history so one of the things that always irritate me when I hear people say like oh Bart he's ahistorical and like he has no interest in history and I'm I'm thinking like just look reading um you know the basic biography and Bart shows that he has actually a pretty good attention towards history um so, I mean, I just thought that that like perspective was pretty warped. So, um, so that actually got me thinking. And I think part of um, about like, okay, you know, I wanted to pay attention to history. And I, uh, in my dissertation, I, I was doing a lot of work with like uh, uh, Jacob Burkhardt and Friedrich Nietzsche. Some of it is in my dissertation, in my, my Fortress book. Um, and so, but I, I was interested in just that critique of like this, master narrative history that you know was the rage you know 100 plus years ago um and bart seemed to be positioned himself in the line of figures like burkhardt and nietzsche who were you know against this kind of like master read of, of history um which you know gets really deconstructed in the last like 50 something years but um so that that was one i think um from there um, it just, you know, the attention towards liberation theology that was like purposely just really interested in history and like very contextual as it theologized was a helpful corrective uh, for myself and just saying like, oh, you know, here's theology like done on the ground, um, but with the same kind of, um, in some way, same kind of, um, within this, in that same parameter of, of questioning the massive story. That, that Bart question, except it did it in a way, uh, I mean, it just took it a step further. I think that goes back to, as I was saying earlier, um, you know, as we go along through the years, I think it's imperative that we, we continue to learn and build upon what others have done, especially on, you know, trying to be um, way more cognizant of, of difference of our own, like, uh, prejudices and and just wrong readings of history um and you know not just get stuck in nostalgia and try to like sugarcoat and, and sweep under the rug certain things um which you know so the other thing we can talk about later which I was just, how do you do that um in a, in, a, in a classroom setting you know because uh i mean well yeah so um but that's that's i think um I think that's what got me from Bart to to liberation theologians, which which some of them have a big role to play in my in my book and further work, and then from there out into just the uh, bigger um, 
Latin American world, um, et cetera. So um, it's just, yeah, just kind of like building upon <laughs> this, this, these, these shifts and trying to like, I think, answer that question about how, to, how do we interpret history? Like who's, who's gonna help me do this, you know, as my, you know, as I approach the classroom, as I approach texts, um, or just as I approach, you know, even writing, like how am I gonna be the most faithful, um, in this process and 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 you know bart bart was very helpful for myself you know 10 15 years ago to just start this process honestly to get me thinking outside the box to some extent um and in a lot of ways like i said there there is that fatigue of, of years and years of study um that that just hits you you know when you when you do uh dissertations um but I think it's it was really helpful and necessary to like build tools to uh, um, map out, look at uh, other things, um, other thinkers, and uh, approach them, and try to have this kind of same um, uh, respect and and awe of of um, these texts that that was gaining with Bart and his own approach to uh, uh, history and, and theology. Yeah, thank you for that. So something that also comes up just in talking about how we you know, approach history and read it is, is your emphasis on, on, on reading with empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, like, do, do you want to talk to us a bit about that? What does that mean? And, and how do we, um, yeah, how, how does someone, you know, approach the, 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 the historical texts with the historical subjects with, with empathy? Yeah, um, I think, well, I know for myself, I try, <laughs> I try to, give as much space to the voice that's behind the page as possible. Um, especially if they're dead, I know Bart had the good line, like, you know, they're, they're pretty, they, they're handed to us <laughs> and they're kind of helpless to, to, you know, what we could possibly do with them. Um, so I think there's a sense of like trying to um, see things from their perspective and give them the benefit of the doubt when possible. Um, I think, and I think a lot of it has to do with, honestly, well, a lot of times where the reader's at when it comes to this. I, I mean, so from my perspective, I think the way, the way I would read somebody with empathy might be different than somebody, you know, else, especially um, via issues of like, you know, uh, well, let's see, I'm trying to put this. Um, I think I never want to tell somebody they have to <laughs> read empath uh, somebody with empathy if if like that doesn't if upon reading it it produces rage and anger. I mean, there's some texts that that should do that. Um, on the other hand, I think there's some times where we see an evolution in a reader or writer, excuse me, um, in in the text, and you can see this person is like grasping for what we see is, is something valuable that we can learn from. And I think that's important um, because sometimes I, I do, it might go back to my first talk uh, or uh, the first question you asked about like, why do historians not read religious writings and why do theologians tend to avoid you know, these big history texts? And part of it is they, they I maybe mean, it's a time, it's a skill set. A lot of times it's, it, it, it's just no passing interest. You know, if they're, if they're like an expert on, I don't know, the Greek literature, they're like, why am I going to read, you know, 20th century Islamic writings on, you know, the political situation you're on, right? I mean, to me, it's like, well, <laughs> you want to learn about this, open yourself up to this and you try to dive into it and try to, you know, especially if you have a dogmatic, like, you know, uh, um, intentionality of like, you know, Badly defend Christianity no matter what in kind of a uh, exclusive way. I think sometimes the message of empathy is good for you know people to go like, okay, lower your defenses for a second to actually engage what they're saying, where where they're at in time and space, and it's probably a lot different than you are. And the only way you're going to be able to like grasp that is is having a certain sense of empathy. But um, I know. I mean, for me, the, the, that's been helpful just to kind of have an open, open eyes, open mind, 
and open ears to certain things. But I know how empathy can also be overused to be like, you know, oh, you know, they didn't really mean it. Just, you know, be open. And and it's kind of like um, this this sense of, I think for some, um, and maybe even for myself at times, I, but it, it could be this kind of um, way too blanket statement about uh, exposing yourself to, to honestly very harmful messages as well. But I think there, there needs to be, uh, you know, some critical thinking involved in, in how we approach certain things. I know, you know, when you do dive into issues like of race in particular, um, I mean, sometimes it's just, just awful, <laughs> you know, and I have students tell me after talking about like the Holocaust or, or um, the Atlantic slave trade, like, why are you bumming this out? <laughs> so I understand there is to some, everybody in the room's in a different place with that. And so there is an element of like how, I, I don't want to purposely bum you out, but I also want to educate you. And so there is this kind of like fine song and dance of, of how to like, you know, sh uh, um, at least illustrate in, in a way, in a, in, a, in a teaching manner, illustrate these ideas so that they can kind of like get what's happening here. Um, and, you know, understand from that event where we're at today in a lot of ways. Thank you for that. I think, I think that like, oh, sorry, that, that connects well with when you write a little about, oh, sorry. No, I was just saying that's really long winded. <laughs> I was just, <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. And I was just thinking how it connects with, um, you write about like Bart, his view of being open to the different voices in history. So not kind of, um, and that's where again, where it pushes against that master narrative kind of thing of like, um, basically, I now am the position that the good parts of history were leading to. Um, mm -hmm. And I look for the voices that I can plot to me and I can ignore all the voices that, you know, are the, the heresies that offshoot it kind of thing. And, right. and yes. the idea, you know, you say about reading history theologically, you, you can't pre predetermine which voice God might speak to you through in the historical process. And so that's the need to read uh, and, and read empathetically and read with the uh, openness to being, taught something or, or convicted of something or challenged or something with, by the any kind of well you know more voices than you might first um assume right yeah uh so there was i was thinking a bit about you talk about at one point that when you know trying to engage global voices try to engage uh those voices from the underside uh, as you say and um that oftentimes when these kind of histories are engaged they're, they're, they're kind of put in a position of victimhood, kind of these perpetual victims are writing these histories. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was thinking about like, you know, there was a big debate kind of in Australia through the 90s and, and there was this phrase of black armband history, which was where a lot of the, um, you know, previous histories of how the Australian colonial enterprise got you know, started and, and rolled out were being challenged. And, and you know, we were looking at the um, true violence and, uh, uh, awfulness that was in, in, in Australia's history and it was challenges from like particularly conservative politicians and historians at the time that what was happening was this black armband history where we couldn't be proud of anything anymore, we had to be ashamed and you know what was really happening was people just telling the truth. Uh, <laughs> but which made me then think about how you talk about it's you know trying to reposition it of the way a lot of these histories are done from the underside is history as resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe I just wanted to yeah open it up for you to talk a little about that the way that yeah, oftentimes it's like, here's a collected work of, of un, uh, underside voices that we put on the side from the main history. It's like a nice compliment and it's the history from the victims compared to, you know, yeah, history as resistance that, that speaks uh, boldly into our um, comfort. Mm -hmm. No, I, well, I think your example is really helpful even in a sense of like <laughs> that history resistance just really tries to tell the truth and um, I think the best kind of it tries to tell the truth with a certain sense of like, well, <laughs> we're doing this because we actually want to see like concrete change, whatever that looks like per, you know, the setting. Um, I think, you know, there's, it goes back to that thing about like the, the inconvenience uh, at times of, of like, <laughs> like uncomfortable truths <laughs> that are there um you know you're always uh, like okay he's the debbie downer at the party <laughs> like there goes bringing up that again you know um and we 
as you as you as in your question we it's very easy to at least attach the token at the end of the semester and go like okay we've done you know you know this nationalist history by the way you know let's tack, tackle in somebody who is like exhibit a of like oh it reminds us we're now we had the shadowy past but we you know we have done it we have arisen over it. we have we have we have issues but like we are gonna get over that <laughs> and you know, I, I think those are actually probably good intentions. Like at least they're saying that because there yeah. is there it'd be there's those that would rather have like not none of that. Mm. And I think that that reality is I think that's what's oftentimes it shouldn't be, but I think that's what's oftentimes surprising now is to see this reality wants like none of it, like no no opposition, no resistance, no truth telling of any sort. We want just this kind of monolithic reading. And you know it's it's take it or leave it kind of idea, um, and I think I think it's been helpful for me to realize like that's not just an anomaly, like that's an actual concrete position by some that that don't like the changes that have happened, you know, in the last fifty, sixty years. Um, so I think I think that's important to realize that you know um, books along those lines are still being written, uh, teachers are still teaching that way. Um, and I think, I mean, personally, I try to do my little part to um, present pictures um, and voices um, and, and theory that addresses um, ways to read, um, especially, you know, these, these uh, really um, sad and, and just absolutely frustrating <laughs> moments in history and in a fine ways to concretely deal with it today. I mean, like on the simple, I mean, one example, like on the simple part, like with my own kids is try to expose them to the literature that is there that I could, for one, t tell them about like, you know, their own particular um, culture um, as, as broadly as, as that sounds, but like, you know, specific readings that go like, hey, you know, you should, there's this famous person who did this and, you know, that's, that's just something you're probably not going to read about and the classroom or might get like, you know, a little tidbit at the end, yeah. but you're mostly going to be learning about presidents and, <laughs> you know, wars and things like that. So here's a, here's a story that can supplement that and, and mm. you know, start slowly um, planting those seeds. Um, because I, I'm oftentimes surprised about, you know, even at the, at the college level, how, how little those voices are heard and how oftentimes students are like oh i never heard about this i want to buy up more of these books or i want to you know learn more about this i mean so um so i think i think that's that's good and it, and i think with history you know because that's that's my field um it is a sense where I, again it's it's today happens so quick <laughs> and the minute we're trying to grasp just like this last hour events change and then we're trying to deal with that I mean, and there's writers and theorists who are really good at approaching like those issues, like at <laughs> the, the moment in hand. And in some ways, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm way more um, um, almost like that line from Bard about like I'm just gonna read <laughs> like like nothing's almost happening, you know, and like try to get from history to to learn something. And it, if it if it happens to like. Um, reflect on the present day then good but i don't i don't want to do this discipline i don't want to read just by being reactionary to every like little thing that's happening um and i think we try to do that when then we're taking the past and put it in our little box and constantly trying to make somebody speak to the day um instead of like spending the time i mean it's like an actual conversation spending the time uh with the person to let them actually speak to us feed us and then you know then Pro probably it's going to help us to like have the right uh, mindset in the in the present day hmm. yeah and no, thank you for that i think that's in, important and, and yeah it is even when you have to push past that discomfort or that um worry about being a downer is, is that yeah, <laughs> dealing with the truth and and yeah but as you said there's ways to do it that are less confrontational or it's just about learning widening the figures you're learning about or the moments in history that you're learning about and reading mm -hmm. about um victories as well as tragedies and all that kind of thing. So, right, right. <laughs> um, your last chapter of the book deals with um, history and cinema. 
and, and while and you focus kind of on the 1986 film, The Mission, but uh, before getting into the chapter, I thought just, you know, random question, uh, any good his history or historical films you've seen recently? Films dealing with historical <laughs> subjects you want to shout out right now? What's the last good one you saw? Oh, wow. That's the <laughs> that a good question. Uh, um, wow. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's always a few that come out every year. Mm. I, haven't, <laughs> I haven't really seen a lot of movies this year. I've been buried in, in class. I did. Um, it's not really a historical film per se, um, but the Netflix, um, there's a Netflix, uh, docu, uh, series called 1994 mm -hmm. on the uh, election in Mexico in 1994. So, um, it references like the, the, um, um, the Zapatista uprising, um, that happened, um, in Chiapas, um, and just had all these different characters from the historical events there. Uh, I found that really interesting because even my wife, who um, was born in Mexico, but I mean, she mostly grew up, almost, you know, mostly grew up here. I mean, she had no real clue about like real Mexican uh, politics and, and stuff. So I know that was really um, important for, for um, I mean, that, that's probably the first one I can think of like, oh, that really like maybe, you know, sit down and think, want to read more about it. And, um, and then just talk to other students, especially those who are interested like in <laughs> Mexican uh, politics and, and mm. history to look at. So, yeah. Oh, great. Uh, so then in that chapter, you, you, you advocate the appeal of the image. And you got to talk about like, you know, good history books should have images in them. Uh, and so I'm, I'm thinking, you know, that, that power of the image when teaching history. And so I guess I'm asking, can you explore for us a little uh, perhaps how that, the pedagogical power of the image, you know, we've kind of talked about how it, in the book you talk about how it kind of affects history and is good for history. How, how, how does it impact the field of theology? Because I was thinking like theology has a, a rich but not uncontested relationship to images, um, mm -hmm. particularly about what, what they can and can't convey. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so I guess I'm just interested in your thought, having thought about that chapter and, and the power of movies to convey history, um, what what then you think about you know as you're bridging the gaps to theology the the power of images and moving images uh in the in the exploration of theology yeah um well i think like for me it was i've always been attracted to art and you know i had one of as long as i can remember from my earliest age like the bible that was around me was one with a lot of the like Baroque painting, very dramatic. Um, and then, um, so I mean, I think as I'm hearing these stories being told to me and reading them myself, I always had these, these images would come, you know, they would fill in like the, uh, the blank space. Um, I think with history, it's a, very, it's a very powerful yet dangerous tool because it, it can like play with the emotional aspect. I mean, there's, there's some things you know, and I, I really started to learn this more and more. I mean, after I even wrote the chapter about like presenting materials in class and showing images, I think when it comes to theology, I'm always so careful because you, you, you never know who's in the room and what they take, you know, their take on images are. So, I mean, obviously a more liturgical tradition doesn't have a lot of problems with like in, uh, representations of Christ or, you know, uh, other figures from uh, um, the Bible or, or church history. Um, whereas um, some, some traditions, you know, they don't like any image and it's all, you know, quote unquote, you know, Catholic and they will raise Cain. About it. <laughs> so, I mean, I've, I've seen stuff like that. And um, so I think with that, there is that um, element to it. I think part of the thing that I've, I mean, obviously it's, it's an obvious thing is um, the way images can, um, especially theological ones, can, can actually connect into history. So I, I spent the last couple of years writing this um, paper on the way Che Guevara is utilized as a theological, Christological image. Um, and so, I mean, he's being painted in murals on churches. Uh, he's painted at the manger scene. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's everywhere. And I mean, for one, it was just the 1960s and 1970s. You know, everybody was down with Che back then. 
Um, but it was also a way of like Latin Americans in confrontation, in resistance against the social political orders at a time who had this Latin American Catholic theological foundation, that's their world and they're painting these images as a way of like trying to relate these ideas that they um, have. And so, I mean, you see like this theological political element in, in these images. And um, I think you, if we're, I mean, they're, they're still being done all over the, all over the place. So I think, again, we miss out when we're not actually like looking and seeing what uh, people are doing. And so, I mean, like with the chase, I mean, there's, uh, there's the uh, um, uh, Brazilian politician, uh, Mariel Franco, who was assassinated a couple a couple years ago from Brazil, she's being muralized all over the place. I mean, there's this element of of doing of, of doing this kind of thing, um, almost presenting icons of these figures, but they're 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 being um, made into icons because they're historical example, they're historical resistance. But like the this this sacred, <laughs> it's almost a, because of their act, they become sac, you know sacred. And I, you know, obviously the Che thing is still kind of with us today and it's perplexing for some. Will Franco, you know, that, that be a thing 10 years from now? I don't know, but it's, it's an interesting phenomenon to see, you know, how um, Christological themes in particular, it seems it's being utilized in art. And these like, at least these examples in, in Latin America. Um, so I try to present it to students because, to, you know, it, it's, it was, new and eye-opening to me mm. uh, I think it's it, it's the same with them um and I think you know that's that's more you know canvas art um when it comes to like photography though I mean even that and, and video like even that has a way of just swaying people and I, I think I've always appreciated uh <laughs> when it's done way more subtle you know in a subtle manner than just trying to like you know produce the tears automatically you know oh you again, the victimhood status um, that oftentimes can, can be used. Um, yeah. And I think, I, I mean, I think that one should always be careful with that, um, you know, to, to pull up art and go, hey, everybody, you know, you're sleeping on this. How dare you sleep on genocide and, you know, try to do that because it, it's obvious that, you know, we can easily just dismiss the image or move on from it or not think about who's on the other side of the image, like, you know, lifeless boy you know or a, or a girl like in you know like some of those refugee images that were you know being just plastered all over social media um so i think there's there's a way to to do that but i mean it's it's all over the place um in a lot of ways and i think uh i've always i've always appreciated particularly like not really um, religious filmmakers were making religious film because they're more about creating the art of it than trying to like hit you over the head with a a message. And I think I mean, that's why they gravitate toward the mission because I felt like it has its prongs, but it still was telling you know, these big themes that were still there that I could still show to a classroom. It's not as, I mean, to the average student nowadays, it's very dated film, but still there's these big themes and they can understand, oh, this is like the consequences of the Spanish and Portuguese coming. And, you know, you see this and it's story plot is actually really messy. I mean, these figures are all messy. <laughs> None of these people should be in this position where they're all at, but it's, that's how we oftentimes find ourselves and then trying to address um, certain situation but like history in that particular film history is weighing in on them from you know the result of 1492 and and stuff so i think it's it's a good way to like you via that film or other films to then go like okay what's the legacy today you know i keep asking that that those questions but you know film does film especially and i think art has a kind of almost confrontational yet disarming way and like lawyers are, are are thinking okay okay we saw this okay we're looking at this what does it provoke out of us outside of a, you know, somebody writing a book and they just like, eh, I'm not going to read that. <laughs> you know, I'm just not going to do it. too clear like this, Matt, where like a picture, a mm -hmm. film is something that can grab our, our, our attention for a time being, but it's, it's something easily we can re keep returning to and, and, and uh, focusing on and share people more open to 
share and, and uh, mm. watch a movie. I mean, yeah. So yeah. And I think like, and and you you write in that that article we mentioned earlier about also then the need for like you know, like fiction plays a role in like um, what the historian should be uh, consulting when pulling like you know they're looking to fiction written about or in a certain period as as, as capturing something again that's um, mm-hmm. a different way into uh, a moment that is uh, yeah can be disarming or can be. Uh, you know, create a different kind of emotional resonance or, or capture a different kind of thing, even if it's dealing with, yes, um, even if it is fictional and not just like a, uh, a you know, a, a uh, receipt for purchases and inventory at a factory kind of thing. Right, right, right. Yeah. No, um, I mean, I, especially like, I mean, Latin America in particular, you know, went through the quote unquote boom where everybody's reading, you know, um, our authors like uh, Marquez and uh, Vargas Llosa. Um, and I, I, I went to that because, I mean, it, it, if, you, if you do the, if you look at the, um, um, the times, it's around the time period of like disappeared peoples, which is a, you know, kind of a common theme in a lot of that literature in the seventies and eighties in places like uh, Argentina. Um, and it's just, I mean, one of the connections I had is I used to get, scared to death of like the rapture happening i mean you know there's probably a lot of people that that have caused the same thing where it's like oh my gosh it happened and i got left and giant bugs are gonna attack me now or <laughs> i'm gonna get shot in a super park and parking lot you know? <laughs> so like i i it was like but that was like a real like like fear for a little kid to be exposed to this and you know it, it's that's the narrative that we were in a theology that, that um, we had, it's still out. Um, it's built on this fear. And, and yet again, to me, like understanding like, okay, this is, this is concrete historical happening at the same time is like people are literally being disappeared. Um, oftentimes dropped in the middle of the ocean. Um, and you had these mothers and grandmothers looking for, you know, their, their kids. Um, I mean, this is literal, like a physical, like rapturing of people and just they're gone, vanished completely and all its trace our images, these pictures, you know. Um, so I found that, you know, for one, yeah, there's a lot of his, it's the historical literature on it, but there's a ton of like um, fiction being written because especially uh, people who lived through it or people um, um, afterwards who are now writing about this historical moment, but doing it in, in a, in, in with, with fiction like a historical fiction i feel like historical fiction is it just the, the good kind has a, has a good way of like placing us <laughs> again that empathy thing placing us in those moments and we realize like okay we have this like <laughs> the united states a young boy had this theoretical fear of like you know encountering uh this garment that's gonna be impressive and it's gonna you know take away my loved ones and disappear me <laughs> well i'm gonna be gone um and yet like here is an example like right um you know miles away from me this is actually happening so i think that's ex- i mean that's that's a kind of like idea i have in mind when when the two realms of theology and history can meet and i just think we just have to be better about trying to make those those connections yeah and and uh and yeah so but and and i think again without focusing i'm I'm purely focusing on the like on you know this disaster story of history um but i i think it it could also you know there's a lot about the culture and um particular stories that are important that we miss out on you know in, in an age where we're way more cognizant about the multiplicity of narrative um and media um that's out there to so i mean it's there it's just for us to to again not drop these fake walls say well i can't read i don't have time or how do i do it i get them like I mean, there's i mean there's so many different way entry points into like learning about um you know whatever you want to honestly but i mean it, it's it's just about the time and commitment to do it i think yeah, no, a hundred percent. And that is the thing. We're we're in a time where the the, the best time to be in if you're wanting to read uh, and experience a diverse 
array of histories and things like that. So um, mm -hmm. we should be taking serious advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, to end, to coming to an end, uh, we play a little game on Love, Rinse, Repeat, uh, which is called Pairings. Um, so if you've ever been in a restaurant where you pair a wine with a meal, you know, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. So we've got the book, Remembering Live Lives. And so what we need to pair the book with is uh, a meal. So, you know, what might someone eat as they sit to read the book? Uh, we need a piece of music that would complement it well, uh, get you in the headspace or, you know, that kind of thing. And then once they've finished reading it, once they've completed Remembering Live Lives, uh, what book should they read next? What book is a good companion piece? To, to yours here. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. All right. So it's a meal, a book, and music. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Uh, um, mm, well, a meal. <sighs> wow. Well, we go with this. <laughs> I, I am going to go with, because um, my, my mother-in-law loves to make this. It's great. It's it's um, it's mole. Um, she's from Oaxaca, so um, the particular type of uh, mole from uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. And it's just like if you haven't had it, you need to try. It. <laughs> but find a like a good like Mexican restaurant that makes it because it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say eat it with that. <laughs> yep. Right. Good. Um, with with some tortillas for sure, just dip them in. Um, so uh, so that music, huh? Music. Um, you know what? I'm gonna go. It makes sense. I think um, one should listen to the mission theme, um, the really famous theme, mm. uh, Gabriel's oboe. I think it's the the name of the song. But I mean, it's it's played all over the place. Mm. And um, I know I had that like in the back of my head while I was <laughs> writing it. I mean, that song kind of drags you in. I mean, watch the movie, they play it over and over and over again. But like, it's, it's a pretty good, I mean, it's an excellent soundtrack. So I think, I think that just, it has the right sense of like uh, sobriety to it, <laughs> especially with the, the, the themes. Um, so, and then what was the other one? Oh, the book. One. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, you know, um, oh, wow, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> I'm trying to think of all the different options there possibly could be. Um, I know um, uh, Dr. Debashi's book was really important for me and he, having him blurb the book was awesome. I, I had no idea. So um, he has one coming out now. Let me, um, if you give me a second, uh, I, and it's, I mean, he keeps writing on these themes and I think that he was helpful, mm -hmm. especially like exposed me like, Oh, Hey, you know, <laughs> he, he would include like Latin American liberation theology in his work mm -hmm. and then talk about like, um, um, Islamic as well. So it was, it was helpful to me to like, actually like look at the big picture and say mm -hmm. like, Hey, yeah, you know, Latin American theology was was a, this unique thing, um, in 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 among you know uh, Christian circles in, in trying to confront mm -hmm. um, some of these the horrors of history um, within the tradition, and you know and that being actually fueled by religious uh, faith and fervor. So I mean that was helpful for me. Um, his book that just came out is called Europe and Its Shadows: Coloniality After Empire. So I. It's on my Christmas card list <laughs> or on my Christmas list. <laughs> I get it, but like I, I try to keep uh, up with what he's doing and go back to stuff I haven't read of his because it's, it's very helpful in, in trying to like look at the more global picture. In a lot of ways, he helped frame that for me in, in the get go. Mm. So yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you for playing Perry's and thank you for joining us on Love, Rinse, Repeat. The book is Remembering Lived Lives, a historiography from the underside of modernity, out with Cascade Books. Pick it up now, buy it for a friend or a family member, and get yourself a copy. And uh, Michael, is there anything else you want to plug or promote right now? Uh, no, um, just thank you again for uh, having me. No, you're welcome. Well, uh, Michael Jimenez, thank you for coming on Love, Rinse, Repeat, the book again, Remembering Lived Lives. Thanks for coming on. Thank you.